I have to say I'm feeling, uh, there's a Finnish candy that I like that when you eat it, the center just melts in your mouth and that's kind of how I feel today. <laughs> My own family came from the western coast of Norway, from my mother's family came from Haugesund, and I served a Finnish mission. And there's something about your response to this, this conference and you coming here on your summer Saturday. I'm so thankful to have the chance to speak among all of these very uh, erudite scholars. I, I, I pinch myself that I'm here among them because I'm not a scholar. And the response to the fair talk that I gave a couple years ago overwhelmed me. I've never been involved in anything that went viral like that. And I hope that you won't mind if I talk about some of those same things, but I also talk about some different parts today, too. So the first title is called This is a Woman's Church. I'm calling this This is a Woman's Church, too. <laughs> As I said, I'm not an academic, but I feel so strongly about certain questions that I'm not sure we know the answers to in the church. And one of them is, what is the matriarchal path? Somebody handed me a piece of paper and it said, are women to do anything in the church besides be helpful? <laughs> and I think that's a very good question. <laughs> we, we do not, we have not expressed or discovered or explored the matriarchal path as much as we have the patriarchal path. I think you have gender differences physically, spiritually, emotionally, and there's a reason for those, and they both have gifts. And I thought that I would maybe talk about that today because the thing that drives me forward is this discussion or this idea about can we be better at describing the matriarchal path. I'm going to start in 1842 when Joseph Smith was uh, founding the Relief Society, and he told the sisters in, on 28th of April, he said, I now turn the key to you in the name of God, and this society shall rejoice, and knowledge and intelligence shall flow down from this time. This is the beginning of better days for this society. And I personally believe when Joseph turned the key for the women of the church, that he wasn't just turning the key to those small group of women that they could perform something. He was doing something with priesthood power that would bless not only the women then, or the women of the church, but all of the women in the whole world. President George Albert Smith said about this action, when the prophet Joseph Smith turned the key for the emancipation of womankind, it was turned for the whole world. And from generation to generation, the number of women who can enjoy the blessings of religious liberty and civil liberty has been increasing. So I believe that when he turned that key, it ushered in unprecedented support and protection and freedoms and self-determination and opportunities for all the women of the earth. I brought this picture to show you, and maybe you've seen it before, but this was taken exactly 98 years ago today, or this month. It was taken in June of 1918, and those are women suffragists in Yotaburi. Sorry for the Finnish pronunciation. <laughs> and they are agitating, you know, or, or demonstrating to have their women's rights. From 1842, if you go back and start looking, when did these movements start to actually make uh, headway in the United States and in other countries? 1848 was when they started. The, the Susan B. Anthony, the American suffragist, and and uh, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in 1848, they said, we're going to hold a conference and we're going to make people pay attention to this issue because they kind of got a little bit shunted to the side during slavery. And you can trace this through all the countries of the world starting very closely after 1842. I find that uh, remarkable. The church has some unique doctrines that are not found in any other religion and certainly not any other Christian religion. And the first one I wanted to talk about is the doctrine of identity. And the church teaches that we started off as intelligences and you can't make an intelligence. It exists and has always existed. But our heavenly parents organized intelligences and gave them a spirit body and once I had a spirit body, during that time, apparently, we were separated into genders. And gender comes with 
certain attributes. I think there are physical attributes. Dr. Perego talked about uh, with certain things that go back through the matriarchal line and the patriarchal line, but there are also stewardships and spiritual gifts and all kinds of things that are, somehow go along with gender. When I became a spirit daughter of my heavenly parents, then suddenly I am in relation to them like family. And one of the great gifts about that is I can speak to them whenever I want to. They have told me, ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be uh, given unto you. Now in the church we pray to our heavenly father because that's the way he taught us to pray. But we know that we have heavenly parents. When we come on the earth, I now get a physical body. And now I'm a much more powerful being because of the attributes of this body. And I can do a lot of more other things. And I, I become a sister. It's, it's a certain role that I've taken on. It talks about how I'm in relation to all of my brothers and sisters who are also of the family of God. But it also means I'm aware of my parents and I'm a Christian and I'm a sister in the gospel and I have certain roles that I, that I perform because of being a sister. In this earth, we also have the chance to be married. And some of us do it on this earth and some of us do it later and sometimes we do it multiple times. <laughs> but it's a chance to be melded or allied into someone else who is a what I call a chosen equal half. I have integrated my intelligence into a spirit body, and that has become part of a, a physical body, a mortal body, and now that being and a separate being are now joined in something that's so powerful at an eternal marriage that they become one in intent. Not physically, but, but in intent and in heart and in goals, they become one. And I believe a great part of what we're trying to learn to do on the earth is to create this kind of unity among ourselves, in our marriage relationship, in a family circle, in a ward, in a visiting teaching route, in a community. We are trying to learn how to build unity from different parts that don't always agree. And that's a huge part of why we're on the earth. And we have the most uh, intimate way of doing that in a marriage relationship. And the final role that we gain here on earth, and there may be others, but we have the chance, I have the chance to be a mother. And a mother is a very, very powerful position because I am bringing life from the other side in conjunction with my husband, and they will always, always be my progeny. And they contain physically parts of me, and I impart part of my spiritual legacy to them as I teach them. And that is, in reality, being like my spiritual parents, which is why I'm here. It's why I'm on the earth. Now, as we all know, men have those same corresponding roles. They are, they are sons, they are husbands, they are fathers, they are brothers, and we, they correspond. Those are the most important things that we do on the earth. And they are teaching us how to be like the eternal feminine and the eternal masculine. And we're taking these paths back to that existence and we're trying to learn things along the way. There are two other doctrines that I feel are unique besides the doctrine of identity. And the first one is Eve wasn't the problem. Most Christian churches teach that Eve was weak, she was sinful, she ate the fruit and she fell. And she caused all of the problems here on earth. And she was punished for it. And our church does not teach that doctrine. In, in LDS doctrine, the fall wasn't a tragedy, and Eve wasn't stupid, and she wasn't weak. She uh, was the catalyst about bringing life and the system of opposing choices into being. And in LDS doctrine, the fall is a blessing. Why is it a blessing? Because it brings us our mortal bodies, and it brings us into the system where we get to choose among opposites. And Eve didn't sin in partaking of the fruit, and she was not punished by God, but rather she and Adam were rewarded by becoming parents, even though they had to work and the sweat of their brow all of the days of their life. Elder Oaks, Elder Dallin H. Oaks said, some Christians condemn Eve for her act, concluding that she and her daughters are somehow flawed, but not the Latter-day Saints. Informed by revelation, we celebrate Eve's act and we honor her wisdom and courage in the great episode called The Fall. 
And Valerie Hudson, who's written a lot on this, Dr. Hudson, she said, in the King James Version of the Bible, we are told that Eve, as part of her punishment, was told that Adam would rule over her. Is that what LDS believe? Actually not. Elder Bruce Hafen of the 70, uh, he quotes Genesis 3.16, and it says that Adam is to rule over Eve, but over, in this phrase, rule over, uses the Hebrew bet, which means ruling with and not ruling over. And as a woman in the church, that one little change, that preposition, makes a huge difference to me. The concept of interdependent, equal partners is well-grounded in the doctrine of the restored gospel. So that's, we're very, very different from other Christian traditions in that way. The third doctrine I thought I would talk to you about is that, I haven't talked to anybody else about this, so I hope you'll bear with me, but it's this idea that the creative power used with discipline is the only thing that endures. And what I'm talking about is it's an awesome power for a man and a woman who have been legally sealed and bound together to use that creative power to call forth life from the abyss, from the other side, and they create another human being that's bone of their bone, flesh of their flesh, and yet it's also different. It, it has a personality that exists all on its own because it's got its own intelligence. When we do that, now in our culture, we just toss that off like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we use the creative power as a, as a recreation, or we, we transact it for money, or we, we do it as entertainment. We do all kinds of things. It, it gets abused, it gets forced, and those are terrible, terrible perversions of that wonderful gift that is given to us that's so powerful. It's so powerful that the temple talks to us a lot about how we should use our body our bodies in discipline. If we don't learn discipline, yeah, we can do whatever we want with that, but we'll never keep it. This mortal life is the time for us to learn how to use that creative force that is actually the kernel of being a god or a goddess, to use it in the right way with discipline, with forbearance, with restraint, so that we can keep it with us in the eternities. And the culture that we live in is the exact polar opposite of that. And we're made fun of, and this doctrine is seen as unrealistic and, and ridiculous, and, and this is just a natural part of life, it's a rite of passage, and, and everybody ought to get inducted about 12 or 13, and nobody should tell you what you should do with your creative power, and nobody can tell you how to control your body, and you should be free. And we somehow mix up promiscuity and doing whatever you want with your body as being free, as if that is the ultimate freedom. The gospel teaches that the ultimate freedom that you do with your body is to be disciplined, to curb those desires to just do whatever, and to have that kind of restraint so that you can go on to other freedoms. And some of those freedoms are the same things that our heavenly parents have offered us. Those three doctrines, the doctrines of our identity, who we really are, the doctrine of the necessity of the fall, and the doctrine of the creative power with restraint is so unique to Mormonism and our doctrine. And it's so powerful when we understand those things and we can live them. I think people, particularly women, but maybe not just women, are very, very hungry to hear and know that doctrine. Because, as I talked about before, the world substitutes these other attitudes about that, and they're on both ends of the spectrum. So the one is the one I talked about of, you can do anything you want with your body, you're free. And that's true, it is true that you can do this, but the consequences of that pile up and pretty soon weigh you down. And the atonement can cover that. But it's very, very difficult to recover fully from those things unless we really, really invest in it and want to and use the help of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you an example of this. I was traveling as a missionary between Uvascula uh, and Espo, and in the middle of the journey, a British woman got on the train. She sat across from me. And, you know, I was enjoying speaking English with her for a little while, and she was in Finland, and she was on some touring company as a dancer. I don't even know what kind of a dancer, but she... she was, you know, chatting with me. And so, of course, she asked in my black missionary tag, she said, what are you doing? What do you believe? 
we talked about this for a little while, and she goes, hold on. So you don't believe in alcohol? You don't drink any kind of alcohol? I said, no. And you don't believe in premarital sex? I said, no. She goes, how do you have any kind of a social life? So, <laughs> we talked about this for a minute. And then it, we're talking about something else, and she goes, I guess if you dated men that felt the same way as you, that that would, might be possible. So we talked and talked. Five minutes later, are there any men who feel that same way as you? <laughs> she started off very, you know, kind of patronizing to me, and she couldn't believe she's going to tell all her friends that she came across this Mormon nun who was on the train. But she left. As she got off the train, I gave her a little card, and we, we said that we would write to each other. She looked back at me, and she kind of gave me a hug, and she was wistful. She started off as sort of patronizing, but she left the train as wistful, and I could see it in her eye. I think about her all the time. She wanted that to be possible. She didn't think it was possible, but she wished that it were, because she could feel how that would make her as a woman feel. So that's the one end of the spectrum. You know, you can do whatever, and, and you get wistfulness that comes out of that. The other side of the coin, and I see this in my work all the time, I am the director of the church's humanitarian arm, and so a huge amount of my work is just seeing the really sad, difficult parts of the world. And the story that I'll tell you is, I happened to be in northern Iraq about 10 months ago, and the Yazidi population, Yazidis are Zoroastrians, they are pre-Christian religion, but they have built what they call their temple in a place called Lalish. And the Yazidi population was targeted by ISIS, and they were driven out of their homes. Most of the women had about 10 minutes warning. Their men were shot in front of them, their young girls were taken away as slaves, and these women with little tiny children just fled without shoes, without anything, as fast as they could go. I talked to one woman, she got out to the road, and she didn't have anything with her except her little toddlers. She flagged down a car just at random and just begged him to take her across the border into Kurdistan, which he did. So now she's arrived up there, and they're traumatized, and they're sad, and they're just, they, they have nothing with them, and they've lost the life that they always thought that they would live. And they make their way to their temple, this Lalish temple, and they were just sitting on the steps of the temple, just sobbing. And they wanted to be there because it was their spiritual home, it was close to, uh, they felt close to God there, and so there were all these old women and little tiny children sitting on the steps of this ancient, ancient temple, just weeping. And they'd been there for weeks, and they just wanted to feel close to their God. There's so much that happens on the other end of the spectrum because of poverty, because of corruption, because of conflict, because of evilness, that disproportionately affects women. And these women were good examples of that. And both of those scenarios, the, the first one that I talked about, about this kind of freewheeling culture of you can do whatever you want, and this other side of when you, you don't have full control of your body because of the circumstances that you live in, both of those situations are disproportionately negative toward women. And the gospel of Jesus Christ sits right in the middle and says, with discipline on both sides, it stops the corruption, it, it helps the poverty, and it also helps us be better for one another and better to one another. And I'm so thankful for that doctrine. I have a friend named Lillian, and she... I don't want to show you that. <laughs> She uh, went to Ghana with her husband, and they were giving some kind of training. She was, I think, in the Relief Society General Board. And so they, he went to priesthood and, sp and spoke in the quorums, and she went to the Relief Society. And afterwards, a woman came up to her in her Ghanaian dress, what they had dressed, and she just pumped her hand up and down. She said, thank you so much for coming. She said, this is a woman's church. And my friend is like, I know. And, but she kept saying it over and over again, this is a woman's church. And finally she stopped and she said, what do you mean this is a woman's church? And she said, you just taught us in Relief Society about the doctrines about being equal in the church and that everyone has a job to do and that God loves his daughters as much as he loves his sons. She said, I've never known that in my African culture. And the church teaches us how to how to eat healthy food and how to teach our children and how to cooperate together and how to work in the community. All of these things that are, that are a wonderful development. 
And at the same time that you're teaching us that, your husband is in the next room teaching our husbands that they must cherish us, that they shouldn't beat us, that they shouldn't beat our children, that their job is to protect the family and lead the family in the spiritual way. She said, when, when those two things come together, that is a church that women can thrive in. And that's a true statement. It is in disciplined environments where women thrive and can best use their gifts. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is trying to carve out that middle ground where men and women can thrive together. And our cultures surrounding that are getting farther and farther away from it. It's hard for us to flourish in a place where people cannot understand that middle ground. Now, we're not perfect. And there's a lot of things in the church that I think we haven't understood or explored. Last Monday, I was in uh, Bergen, and I took the funicular up to the top of the hill, and there was this sign. Can you read it? It says, please don't something the invisible something. <laughs> that is such an interesting, tantalizing sign. What does that sign mean? Please don't what the invisible what? <laughs> Somebody has broken it off. And sometimes I feel like, although we have beautiful, transcendent, glorious doctrine, we've broken off parts of it and we don't understand what it is it's trying to tell us. And we have to do a little bit more work. The restoration is ongoing, and we've just barely started. Think about that picture about Yuktaberi and how different we are a hundred years, years later and all the things that have evolved since that time. Well, we're still evolving from 1830 and 1842, and the Lord has so many things that he wants to reveal to us. The article of faith says he will yet reveal many great and important things. But we have to do our part and repair that part of the sign. And sometimes I feel like I'm dealing with little fragments like that, and I don't know exactly what it is. I have lots and lots of questions, as do you. I've seen people writing them, as I've talked about here. I have already told you my first question, what's the matriarchal path? Are women just supposed to be helpful, or do we actually have predetermined, predesigned stewardships that we're supposed to be doing? Uh, another question I have is, can we coin new terminology that describes the spiritual experiences that women have that are, that are different from men? Can we talk about and have terminology for We've come up with sister leader. I think it's awkward and strange, but we, at least we tried. <laughs> there are other things that we don't know the names of, and we've talked about this before. We don't know what to call a mission president's wife, so she has this strange title on that. In the temple, we do know what to call a temple matron. She has a name. And I think we could be much, much more imaginative at describing the specific experiences that women have that are unique to being a woman. And they're not all about childbirth and, and raising children there, we see things differently. We are designed to observe things differently, and we ought to explore the terminology that we can uh, name those things. And I send out a challenge to you, as I did in Germany when I spoke at FAIR, and they took it up. They said, we are going to coin new words for these things. We're going to identify them. We're going to make lists. I hope that we will. I think it would be really interesting to post some of that on FAIR. I would like to explore in what ways does section uh, 84, the oath and covenant of the priesthood, is there any possibility that some of that applies to sisters in the church? And I don't know that we've explored that, and I think it's very, very interesting. I don't know what preside actually means. More than a sentence, I don't know fully what that means, and I don't know what nurture means more than just a sentence. If, if that's the tip of an iceberg and the proclamation on the family tells us that those are our divine responsibilities, what do they mean? And can we describe in more detail to us and to the rising generation, what does it actually mean to do those things? The prophets have been trying in the last five years to help us, and I'm going to read you five statements that have come out since 2010. The first one is Elder Dallin Oaks. He said, we're not accustomed to speaking of women having authority of the priesthood in their church callings, but what other authority can it be? This is Elder Russell Ballard. When men and women go to the temple, they are both endowed with the same power, which by definition is priesthood power. This is President James Faust. 
Every father is to his family a patriarch, and every mother a matriarch as co-equals in their distinctive parental roles. This is Sister Patricia Holland. The Lord has not placed us in the lone and dreary world without a blueprint for living. I, the Lord says in Doctrine and Covenants 52, I will give you a pattern in all things that you may not be deceived. He has given us patterns in the temple ceremony. As we study these patterns, we must continually ask, why does the Lord choose to say these particular words and present it in just that way? We know he uses metaphors and symbols and parables and allegories. We have all recognized the relationship between Abraham and Isaac that parallels God's anguish over the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. But as women, do we stretch ourselves and also ask about Sarah's travail in this experience as well? We need to search in this manner and we need to always look for deeper meaning. We should look for parallels and symbols. We should look for themes and motifs, such as those we would find in Bach or Mozart. And we should look for repeated patterns. And this is President Ezra Taft Benson. He said, the order of priesthood spoken of in the scriptures is sometimes referred to as the patriarchal order because it is handed down from father to son. But this order is otherwise described in modern revelation as an order of family government where a man and a woman enter into a covenant with God just as did Adam and Eve to be sealed for eternity, to have posterity, and to do the will and the work of God throughout their mortality. I don't think we fully understand what those statements mean, but we're on a journey and the restoration is ongoing. And I know that revelation isn't just linear. It doesn't just progress the way our logical minds think. Sometimes there's just a giant leap. And other times it's hiding in plain sight right in front of us. But if we do not ask, the Lord will not reveal those things. And one of the points that I wanted to make today is it is the privilege, particularly of women, to find out about the matriarchal path. I'll tell you a story, it's an experience of my own. Because of my work, I sit in a council, and the council that guides LDS charities, that's the three presiding bishops and the three General Relief Society presidents. They make up the board of LDS charities or the council in the church government. And we were talking about a specific issue, and turns out I'm the only one who felt a certain way. I felt very strongly about something, and the six of them felt a different way. And I so appreciated, you know, they could have just shut me down. They could have just, nah, we're not going to do that. But they didn't. They listened to me, and they asked a bunch of questions, and then they didn't make a decision because not all of us could agree. And they were practicing the skills of councils in the church. And we, we, all, we don't always follow that pattern that they just said because we'll take a vote, majority rules, you know, that's a different system. Or sometimes we'll just gloss over that because we're more powerful, I'm the boss, and so I'm going to decide. But the way that the Lord has set up church government is that everybody needs to come to a unity of feeling, and that's how you know that the Spirit of the Lord is present. And if one person can't feel it or feels uncomfortable, then we need to wait, and we need to get more information, we need to ask more questions. And we have that structure, but we don't follow it very well in the church. Women do not participate in councils fully in most places in the church. And part of it is they're not listened to, and part of it is they're too shy. They just sit there, <laughs> and they don't offer up the thing that they are feeling and hearing. And part of it is they don't, they don't know that they'll be respected the way I was in that, in that council. And we need to be better at that because the perspective that they have is critical to creating the balanced government that should be part of the church. The Lord is trying to teach us that, but we have not practiced it, I don't think, very well in the, in the at least sometimes. To close, or to close, just at the last section of this talk, I want to talk about um, three advancements or interesting observations that I've made that the church is moving forward, trying to help us develop this idea of the matriarchal path and the patriarchal path. These have happened since I gave the original fair talk two years ago. And I wanted to bring them up today because maybe you haven't paid as much attention to them. They're easy to miss. 
In 2011, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, the Church Relief Society sent out a little blue book called Daughters in My Kingdom. How many here have a copy of that book? All right, raise, keep your hands raised if you own it in your native language. The church went to a huge amount of work to have that document published in every sister's native language. I think they covered 99.6% of the church. Why would they do that? This is a serious question. Why would they do that? <laughs> Say it again. It's important, but now I'm going to put you on the spot. How many people have looked at that book in the last year? This is a book about the historical underpinnings of what it means to be a woman in the church and in the gospel. It was sent out to every single woman at no charge in her own language. Do you know what it took for the church to be able to put that whole thing together and do that? It's never been done before. Not since the time of Emma Smith and Eliza R. Snow when they could all fit in one room. Never been done before. And yet, we don't pay that much attention to it. And I don't know that we're using it very much. I'm not even using it very much. I happened to hear, I went to a, a church history symposium and I heard Julie Beck, Sister Julie Beck, talk about how that book came into being. And I'm going to read you some of her talk. She said, we began as a Relief Society presidency talking about the need for a way to give sisters a tool to carry around the purpose of their Relief Society in their own lives. We recalled that the second general Relief Society president, Eliza R. Snow, had carefully preserved the minutes of the first Relief Society meetings containing instructions from the Prophet Joseph Smith. He said they were meant to be the constitution for the sisters. Sister Snow used that minute book for many years as she traveled and taught the Relief Society and the priesthood leaders to firmly establish the work of Relief Society. Since our work it was spread so far across the world and since so many sisters were striving to keep their covenants in relative isolation, I asked myself, this is Julie Beck, I asked myself if it would be useful for every sister to have something that would function as her personal minute book. In order to achieve a global alignment, would it be important for each of them to have a constitution or a blueprint to follow? Now was the time to bring forth a history. It was envisioned as a record that would be a spiritual legacy. It was to be the vehicle that would carry our purpose into the homes and the hearts of four million women worldwide. To be understood and applied across culture, language, economy, and experience. We were instructed by the First Presidency that the project was to be directed by the Relief Society General Presidency, not the curriculum department, not a team of writers, and we had full backing of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve in this assignment. We were told to keep the project out of the machinery. You are the presidency, we are told. You are the ones who should decide what it looks like, what it feels like, and how it's going to be used. We're not going to tell you what it is. You are going to tell us, and you are going to bring it to us when it's finished. I came to the realization that for many years, prophets and Relief Society leaders had sensed the need for a clear, global, unifying message for the women of the church. And in our discussions, there was an expressed hope to preserve the spirit of Relief Society in every home. I came to believe that seers of our time could see the fruits of this Daughters in My Kingdom extending through generations and far into the future. That's the first thing. And it's gone by pretty quietly, pretty under the radar. And yet, it's a global connection for the first time with this constitution of what it means to be a sister, a Christian, part of the matriarchal side of the restored gospel. The second thing happened last year. This is President Nelson. You'll remember this because it was so stirring in conference. He was pleading, and he, he titled the talk, A Plea to My Sisters. He said, we need women who are organized and women who can organize. We need women with executive ability who can plan and direct and administer, women who can teach women who can speak out, women with the gift of discernment, who can view the trends of the world and detect those that, however popular, are shallow and dangerous. 
Today, let me also add that we need women who know how to make important things happen because of their faith. We need women who teach fearlessly. We need women who know how to access the power of God that he makes available to covenant keepers and who express their beliefs with confidence and charity. We need women who have the courage and the vision of our mother Eve. I plead with my sisters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to step forward and to take your rightful, needful place in your home, in your community, in the kingdom of God. More than you ever have before, I plead with you to fulfill President Kimball's prophecy, and I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that as you do so, the Holy Ghost will magnify your influence in an unprecedented way. Now, if you're a Mormon feminist, if you'll use those words, who doesn't want that promise to come forward? I promise you that your influence will be magnified in an unprecedented way. Can you start to see the way that these dots are connecting? You've got a global identity that holds sisters together. You've got the president of the Quorum of the Twelve pleading with sisters to rise up and use their covenantal energy to do something different in the world that's never been done before. And then just this last conference, just two months ago, Sister Linda Burton, the General Relief Society president, got up and she invited the sisters of the church, including the young sisters and the primary children, to participate in a mission, in a stewardship, in, a, in a, something that they were asking the women to take on as their stewardship. She said, in a world of constant change and commotion, we often feel like strangers. All around us, we hear about distress and tragedy and hardship. Many around us live in fear of an unknown future. What can our role be as women in the last days to prepare the earth for the coming of the Son of God. Are you kidding? I'm paying attention to that. She's now asking me if as a woman in the gospel, I want to do something that will help prepare the earth for the coming of Jesus Christ. We have the invitation to share our love, our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, to strengthen others and to love them as the Savior would do. This is not a program, it's who we are. For the first time, efforts have been made on a global scale to unify, to build a group identity, and to give a particular mission to LDS women. And that is very, very energizing to me. So I'm going to end with where I began in 1842, with the turning of that key by Joseph Smith. I told you about how the first convention was held pretty soon after that in 1848. And from that time on, in lots of different countries, women progressively got the right to vote, to work, to hold office, to own property, to have their rights protected within marriage and the workplace, to be paid equally, to have equal access to health care and retirement. If, as President George Albert Smith said, that this is actually part of the restoration, starting in the U.S. and quickly spreading to other places around the world as a result of divine intervention, when for centuries women had not been able to do it on any kind of a large scale, then LDS women are the guardians of these freedoms in a literal way. And we must vote, we must hold office, we must be wise landlords, we must work to protect the rights of ourselves and others and all minorities, and we must do it in the gospel way and not in the world's way. These are precious rights, and they are part of the restoration of all things, and it's an indication of our equality and value in the courts of heaven and in the government of God. And it also means that it's part of the matriarchal stewardship on the earth. And we, as the daughters of Eve and Sarah, bless the whole human race. It means that we might take up the cause of refugees or Yazidi girls or trafficked women or children or the strangers among us or the modern slaves of the earth. I wouldn't give up this membership in this church for anything there is nothing else that has the power to give me those opportunities and to answer the greatest desires of my heart. I, of course, agree with that sister in Ghana. This is a woman's church, and it will continue to be more and more an equal, positive union of men and women working together, of brothers and sisters, truly brothers and sisters so that we understand one another. And I'm so thankful that not in agitation, not in agitating and wrangling, but in 
unity in the way that councils function or should function, we have the opportunity to do something that has never been done on a large scale, and yet it is what the world will do as we come toward the second coming. I wouldn't be a man if I had the choice. I love the identity and the gifts that come to me from being a daughter of heavenly parents. And I'm thankful to believe in a church that is working as part of an active restoration to understand what that means and to do more about it. And I pray, my friends uh, Asia and Milan are here, they're, they're the next generation. I pray because I have a lot of nieces and nephews who don't understand this, who listen to the voices of the world and are leaving the church that could give them everything they want because of this, this discontent that they feel. And I pray that I and all of you and everybody else can be better at articulating what we believe and asking the right kinds of revelatory questions so that we can teach this to the next generation. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So this is an interesting question. It says, a woman has to depend on a man to take part of the priesthood power and inspiration, but a man is not in any way dependent upon the woman. How can the two genders still be seen as equal? There's a lot that's been written on this, and I might refer you to Valerie Hudson, who has an interesting idea. She talks about that all humanity is born through the gate of a woman. And although a man participates in that, the woman is the guardian at that gate, and all mortality comes through women, including even Jesus Christ. And that the way to get back through the other side is that they must pass through priesthood ordinances that the men stand at the guardian of. And it's an interesting idea about this, this parallelism. We each help each other in that work, but that women have certain responsibilities and men have certain responsibilities. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but there's some very good articles out there to read. Valerie Hudson. She's, she's a, she, she was a professor at BYU, but I think she's moved to a new university. The article they might want to read is called The Two Trees, and it's on the Fair Mormon website. So on the Fair Mormon website, the article is called The Two Trees. This says, in the book Daughters in My Kingdom, there is a chapter that lists important events in Relief Society history, but it does not mention that there was 10 years, 1844 to 1854, that Brigham Young suspended Relief Society due to Emma's work against plural marriage. Why? I don't know. They should have included that. <laughs> it's part of our history, and, and there's, there's no question. Can you imagine during that time how easily the church could have broken apart over this issue of polygamy? If it feels the way it does to us now, imagine what it felt like when they were in the middle of it. And Brigham Young, in order to, to calm things down and then restart them again back in Utah, he, he took that step. I, we don't need to shy away from that. It's not, it's not scary. But I don't know why they didn't put it in the book. They probably should have. This is how can we step forward when the church structure seems to hinder exactly that. It seems that when you, have, you don't have an official calling, you are to do nothing and you have no say. I don't know if that's a church structural problem or if it's a cultural problem within us because we're, maybe we're conditioned not to step forward if we don't have an official calling, but I think a lot of things have been done in this world before people had official callings. I think about primary and how primary was begun. You had boys in Farmington, Utah that were breaking into people's melon patches and smashing them. And there was a sister in that neighborhood that said, no, that's not good for the boys, it's not good for the melons. <laughs> Let's do something about that. And she created what became primary. That's how primary started. I think Sunday school was, was started because of, of a grassroots effort. A lot of the programs of the church came from somebody who had a good idea. Now, if you ask Scott Gordon, did you uh, get sanctioned to start Fair Mormon? Did you get called? No. It, it was something that he felt was needed and felt would be beneficial to people. And all of you that volunteer, the translators and the, the organizers here that have done such a great job, you're doing that not because of a calling, but because of your passion and you care. And I think uh, that's, there's something wonderful about that, and I think the Lord honors that. Actually, most of the programs. Most of the programs. I, I believe that. If you could spend time with any General Relief Society president, who would it be? <laughs> That's a very rich question. <laughs>
I think a lot about Amy Brown Lyman. She had a very difficult presidency. She was a social worker, and she actually began LDS Family Services. And she worked very hard at uh, World War I, and then she had a tragedy in her family, and her husband was not faithful to her, and uh, afterwards she was released. And I think she felt bad about getting released early. I think she thought she was suffering a little bit because of something that she couldn't control. And I think she bore all of that with grace. She never wrote anything about it, but I would love to sit and talk to her about that. I'll answer one more question. How can we help all the women and the men who suffer, uh, who, don't, who aren't married, and they don't have the possibility to have children? We are crying. We always talk about them as a family. I'll tell you from my perspective, because I'm in my 50s and I'm not married, and I have gone through a lot of emotions in my life. But one thing that I am grateful for is that if people will stop focusing on my marital status and lining me up, and if they will just accept me as an adult, a productive adult that has things to offer and let me, you know, be parts of their family and, and learn to love their children. And I've been very, very lucky. I was thinking on the plane as I came over. There are 29 children in my life that I feel like I'm deeply connected to. And they're at different stages of their development. Do you know what a richness that is in my life? Now, I completely have faith that my my temple endowment opens the door or reserves a place for me to have the things that I want. And I want a husband and I want children. But if it doesn't happen in this life, the richness that I can have by being part of the families in my circle is a great, great gift. There are things that only ants can do. Parents can't do them. And you'll take them from an ant when you won't from anybody else. And I love to be that kind of a friend to somebody else. And I hope you have the chance to do that too. But I would encourage you, ask your single friends, what would they most like? <laughs> because some people are different. Uh, Mar my friend Marvin said the thing he wanted when he was single, line me up. He said, introduce me to the people that you know. So we all feel differently, we're not all the same. Thank you for letting me come today. You, Scandinavia is so warm in my heart.